Growing up in the United States while the Sega Master System was on the market, I experienced it very differently than some of you elsewhere. Nintendo absolutely dominated the gaming scene here, and I was hard-pressed to even find a store in my area that carried Sega products back then. I also didn't own a Sega Master System when it was first released, and instead relied on a friend to actually play anything. Luckily, he received games often, and he did have the 3D glasses, so at the very least I had access to some of the better stuff in the library in the late 1980s. When I finally decided to do this top 10 for the old Master System, I realized pretty quickly that what I associated as the platform's best software was radically different from other people. You may recall I did a top 10 Game Gear episode a while back, and that's an important point to bring up now. The US market for the Sega Master System was pretty much dead by the time the Game Gear was released, so many of the titles someone in Europe or Brazil may associate with the Master System I look at as primarily Game Gear experiences. That's really important to note here, because I played games like Castle of Illusion first and foremost as Game Gear titles. I encourage you to take a look at my Top 10 Game Gear games video to see how these two platforms were very split for me, and I hope it explains my thinking and experiences a bit better with Sega's 2-8-bit platforms. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy my Top 10 Sega Master System games. I grew up playing baseball, so it was only natural that I was drawn to a video game about the sport, particularly one as good as Reggie Jackson's baseball. Released in 1989, it was one of Sega's first steps in getting big-named athletes to be the face of their home sports offerings. This is pretty much the 8-bit version of the Mega Drive's Super League, or what would become known as Tommy Lasorda Baseball. The field setup and batting are very similar, as is the majority of the gameplay. I really love the visuals here. Umpires are where they're supposed to be and the crowd is animated. When you hit a ball into the outfield, it had a cool scaling animation that was present in the Genesis title, and the gameplay is still really fast arcade style fun. It has a tournament and home run contest to break up the normal games, and though it isn't officially licensed, it does have a bunch of real cities you can play in. It was released in other territories as American Baseball, and is easily my favorite sports title on the platform. Growing up a wrestling fan, I was always drawn to games that let me live out my fantasies of beating down opponents with chairs and making them give up with vicious finishing holds. When I played pro wrestling on the Sega Master System, I fell instantly for its easy to understand mechanics. It's a really simple game to be sure, but one that can bring a ton of fun, especially if you have a friend with you. You can lure opponents out of the ring, bash them with a chair, and then lock in the Boston Crab for the win. Later wrestling games added a ton more variety and things to do, but in 1986, this was a blast to play. The Japanese release of this was actually based on ladies pro wrestling, and featured Dump Matsumoto, a popular performer at the time. This version was originally a port of the System 16 arcade game Body Slam, that was released around the same time. There are a handful of games on the Sega Master System that just annihilate their NES counterparts, and 1989's Rampage is one such game. It looks better, it sounds better, and it plays better. Full stop. The two-player mode offers nearly endless fun for all ages, and there are a bunch of stages to destroy to assure a high replay value. Sega actually did the port of this in-house, and Activision published it in the United States, but it never received a release in Japan. This was one of my most played games on the Master System at the time. 
I enjoyed its cooperative and competitive aspects and felt it was on a completely different level than the weak looking and playing NES title. It was a rare win for Sega at a time when Nintendo received a lion's share of third party support in the United States, and a fine example of what could have been had more games been given a shot on Sega's platform. I first played Master of Darkness on the Game Gear, where it was called Vampire Master of Darkness in the US. I've played it enough since on the Master System to associate it with that platform, however, and I have come to enjoy it quite a bit. In 1993, Sega wanted a Castlevania clone, so they developed this in-house to get the job done. They did very decent work, too, both in the visuals and sound department. This one is more colorful than what we saw in Castlevania, and while the music lacks the classic stylings of the Konami game, it still sounds appropriate here and does the settings proud. The gameplay is nearly a straight mirror image of its inspiration, however, and only the ability to change your main attack weapons being of any real consequence. I really wish Sega had made more of these. I would have loved a sequel on the Mega Drive using the Shadow Dancer or Shinobi 3 engine, and Sega could have had a Metroid-style version of it for the Sega Saturn. Alas, Sega only did this one, but it's a solid game if you're a fan of Konami's work. You guys know I'm not the biggest Alex Kidd fan in the world. I found most of those games tough to stomach, but when it came to Alex Kidd and Shinobi World, I loved every second of it. Released in 1990, it was the kind of game that could pull you away from your genesis and entertain the heck out of you. It had everything an action game needed. You could do far more than just attack with your sword. You could grab bars and launch yourself at enemies. You could wall jump. And of course, being a Shinobi game meant that you could use ninja magic. The gameplay was so much tighter than previous Alex Kidd games, and the levels were designed to be faster moving and provided a bunch of places to use your additional moves. It mostly uses parody to give you an alternate version of enemies and stages from Shinobi, and even takes a few swipes at Mario along the way. I'm really hoping the Miracle World remake does well so we can get a modern update of this one at some point. Being a big fan of arcade action games when I was younger, the Master System 1989 port of Rastin appealed immediately. It retained enough of the look, sounds, and feel of the original to do the experience justice, and is easily one of my most played games on the Master System. The concept here couldn't be any simpler. Navigate the stage layouts, kill the enemies, and look out for power-ups. You could get different weapons to help you out, and each stage of course ended in a fight with a powerful enemy. It was damn hard in places too, the kind of difficulty born from a simple missed jump wrecking an entire session in an instant. Don't get discouraged though, you will get better, you will master the flow of enemies and platforming segments, and by the end of this adventure, you will feel a sense of accomplishment that only the great games can give you. In 1992, North America and Europe got great 16-bit versions of Wonder Boy and Monster World. With the success of the Sega Master System platform in Europe, it was also released for that, in what was an unbelievably solid port. Just look at it, full of color and detail well beyond your usual 8-bit limitations. While mainly an action game, it's loaded with small RPG and adventure elements, including lots of exploration, items to discover, and people to talk to. 
The Sega Master System take on this wasn't the first time I played it, but it was just so impressive when I found it, I just had to play through it. I was met with not just a great looking game, but also one that sounded good and was an adventure well worth taking. Nintendo Zelda saw a ton of success in the late 1980s with two 8-bit releases on the NES. Sega wanted in on some of that action and internally developed Golden Axe Warrior, a shameless copy of the first Zelda title in just about every way. And you know what? Who cares what it copied, because this is still a great playing game. You move screen to screen battling enemies, collecting money, discovering secrets, and defeating dungeons, all in your quest to collect the nine crystals and defeat the vile Death Adder. Loosely wrapped up in the world of Golden Axe, you are Axe Battler, warrior and savior of the land. You can find different weapons and items to help you out. There's stuff to buy, items to equip, and magic to acquire. It's a fully featured action adventure that looks better than Zelda, plays similar, and is overall a solid title start to finish. The only real weakness this game has is that Sega didn't make more of them. I was not a fan of role-playing games in my youth. I was an arcade kid, pure and simple. So when I say I enjoyed Fantasy Star, that means more than one may otherwise think. It hooked me with its insane difficulty, believe it or not. Not being used to RPGs at this point, I really didn't know how to play them well. It took me a while to understand the leveling up mechanic and the need to really pay attention to what the NPCs were saying. I can't tell you how many times I got lost got killed, and just suffered defeat after humiliating defeat trying to come to terms with this game's design. I was so intrigued by its visuals and story, however, I just had to keep playing. Fantasy Star is really a revenge tale, and it's one where you'll meet others on your quest and discover that there are a lot of things to worry about. It came on a cart that was 4 mega power, had a battery backup, and was one of the prettiest games I had ever seen at that point. It came out in 1988, the year before the Sega Genesis in the United States, and set up a series that would see a number of entries that were well worth playing. Try this out for the cool 3D style dungeons, but you'll stay for the great story and gameplay. Sometimes a system gets a piece of software that defines the entire platform. For the Master System, that game wasn't Wonder Boy, Alex Kidd, or Sonic, it was Shinobi. The iconic ninja action game was a port of the arcade, System 16 original, and in many ways, it was a better game. It didn't have the same level of visuals, of course, but the gameplay was just as solid, and I actually enjoyed the Master System music better. Sega opted to give you a life bar in this version, as well as a few additional items, magic, and power-ups. The action is straightforward but still challenging, and the final enemy of each area are all memorable fights. The only weakness this game has is that it isn't as long as it could have been. I would have loved to have seen a couple of more Sega Master System exclusive stages added to make it longer and more challenging. Outside of that, it was a major part of my Master System experience and the defining title of the platform's early life. It would go on to spawn many games in the series that were excellent in their own right, but this was the first, and I loved every minute of its excellent design and gameplay. So now that you've seen my Master System Top 10, I hope you have a greater appreciation by what I meant in the opening segment. What I played and win for this platform was all over the place. 
From 1986 to 1989 was when I spent the most impressionable amount of time with it. Many games for the Master System I discovered on the Game Gear, very much changing how I identify with each of them. Many of you would likely have some Disney titles in your Master System Top 10, or maybe Ninja Gaiden, or Sonic, or maybe even one of the many Genesis ports. Most of these games were on the Game Gear for me, leaving me a very different impression of each one. While it's easy to look at the two platforms as virtually interchangeable in some respects, the games I played on the two felt like completely different platforms. Part of that was because some of these never saw a Master System release in the United States, and part of that is because the Master System was so scarce in my area, even when it was on the market. I'd love to hear what your top 10 is, and what region you were in at the time. For many of you, it's likely quite a bit different from mine. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.